by might, it's not by power, but by his spirit, said the Lord. That is the word of the Lord to us today. Any one of us experiencing difficulty, trials, testing, you know, whatever mountain stands before us, the Lord said, it is not by might, it is not by power, but by his spirit, said the Lord. This mountain shall be removed. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah, it is not by might, it is not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. We give the Lord thanks, praise God, hallelujah, we bless God, amen. Today, greetings in the most precious anointed name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We continue in the book of Luke, where we left off a few weeks ago. We will just pick up in the book of Luke, and I think today we are in Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, we will just pick up there with our Bible exposition. If, if you are attending Straight Gate Ministries, you know that the Bible is very important to us. We put a lot of emphasis on Bible teaching, teaching the Word of God, explaining the Word of God, getting to know what the Word of God is saying to us. The Word of God is our guide, it's our light, it's our protection, it's our deliverance, it's our source, it's our sustainer, it provides for us, it keeps us. Praise God. Amen. It's our life. Bless the Lord. The power of the Word of God. The Word of God break and destroy every yoke. The Bible said the word of God is like the hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. Praise the Lord. Amen. We bow heads in prayer. Father, we want to thank you today for allowing us to be together another time in your house. We want to thank you for the congregation of your people, Straight Gate Ministries. Lord, continue to bless us and continue to give us a hunger and a thirst within our hearts for more of you. Help us to know that God, we can depend upon you. You are faithful, God. You are loving, God. And you are touched by the feelings of our infirmities. Reach out your hands today and embrace someone as we, oh God, look into your words. In Jesus' precious, wonderful name. Praise the Lord. In Luke chapter 5, we pick up there today. Said, And it came to pass that as the people press upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Genezareth. Now, you remember in the last uh, section uh, in Luke chapter 4, remember where Jesus went back to his hometown, Nazareth, and he went into the synagogue and they gave him the Old Testament scroll, the scripture to read, and he turned to Isaiah 61 and he was reading from Isaiah 61 where the Spirit of the Lord God is upon him. And then he read where the Lord said that he sent him to heal the brokenhearted, those who are poor, those who are spiritually poor, spiritually bankrupt, spiritually handcuffed by the enemy. The Lord sent him, Jesus, to bring deliverance to them. And as he read the scripture, at the end of the scripture, he applied that to himself. Remember that they run him out of town and they, were, they wanted us to throw him down you know, from the brow of the, the, the city hill so that they can kill him. And uh, he passed through their midst and go his way. And after that, the Bible tells us that he went into the house of Peter, Simon. He went to the, into the house of Simon, apparently. Simon Peter, uh, his house was not far from the synagogue. And it is believed that after the synagogue uh, worship, uh, they used to have fellowship in homes. So he went to the home of Simon Peter, and there the Bible tells us that Simon Peter, uh, his mother-in-law was sick with a, a great fever, and uh, they besought the Lord to heal Simon Peter's uh, mother-in-law, and the Lord prayed for her and deliver her from that great fever, and immediately, imme immediately she got up from her bed, wherever she was, and she ministered to those people who was in Simon Peter's house. So it seemed as though there was a, a short, certain amount of time that passed before we uh, have chapter 5, the situation that we are facing here in chapter 5. 
So it tells us, and it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, people was pressing on Jesus to hear the word of God. A multitude of people surround Jesus, and these people was hungry for the word of God. And according to what Josephus reported to us in his history of the Jews, he said at that time, during that period of time, it seems as though um, Galilee probably have about 3 million people in that area. And uh, uh, it is believed that that area was, you know, greatly populated. And there was a lot of people in the area. And the Bible is telling us here that the people was pressing on Jesus. In other words, they were coming closer and closer to him. They want to hear the word that was coming out of his mouth. Because they regard the words that comes from Jesus as the word of God. This is what they said. Uh, they want to hear the word of God. It was the very word of God that was coming out of the mouth of Jesus. Brethren, when we open up the scripture, when we read from the word of God, it is God who is speaking to us. The Bible said that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And we must esteem God's words. And we must become hungry for God's words. We must become thirsty for the word of God. We must want the word of God more than our very food, more than the air that we breathe, because the word of God will sustain us. The Bible said that the word of God is good medicine. My son, attend unto my word. Incline thine ear unto my saying. Let not my word depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the center of thine heart. For they are life unto those that find it. And health unto all your flesh. So if you are sick, by just reading and meditating on the word of God, the word of God can restore our health. The word of God is powerful. Praise God. And here these people, they realize that Jesus was speaking the very word of God. So they began to come closer and closer to him. And the Bible is telling us here that they were close or by the lake of Genazareth, which was the Sea of Galilee, the same uh, uh, place that they're talking about. He stood by the lake of Genazareth and, as he, and he saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. So here we see that the fishermen... In Galilee at that time, they used to fish in the night. And these fishermen, they went out the night and they came back and they were washing their nets. They were preparing their nets for the next time they were going out. And here we see the Bible tells us in verse 3, And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he should trust out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. So here we see Jesus was preaching the word of God. And the people was getting closer and closer to him. It was a multitude of people. And it seemed as though like they back him right onto the seashore. So for him to get some room, as these men, they were out of their boats, their fishing boats, washing their nets. Jesus took the opportunity to use one of the fishing boats boat that was there to be his pulpit. Jesus used the fishing boat to be his pulpit to deliver the word of God. And uh, the ship that he entered into, the Bible said it belongs to the same Simon. You remember we talk about Simon and it's Simon Peter. Uh, Jesus went into his house from the synagogue. They have fellowship in Simon Peter's house. Jesus went there and he healed Simon Peter's mother-in-law. And here Simon Peter, he is making his fishing boat. His fishing boat become available. Jesus using Simon Peter's fishing boat to, for his pulpit. And what I'm seeing, seeing here is that it seems as though Peter, whatever he had, he make it available for the Lord. The Lord was welcome in Peter's house. He was welcome for, uh, to whatever Peter Refreshment was provided in Peter's house. And now Simon make his boat available to become a pulpit for the Lord Jesus Christ. And whatever we have in life, we ought to make it available for the Lord. 
We ought to make our vessel, our life available for, for the Lord. Anything you possess. The Bible says we must love the Lord with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength. Whether it's your life, your time, your finances, you should make it available to the Lord. And I'm not trying to be like some of these money grabbers that are out there that will use these words and these opportunities to get people to bring more money and more money to the church. I'm not telling you to do that. And I'm going to tell you right now, I don't want nobody in this church to give more money to the church than they're not supposed to. I don't want you to take all of your money and give it to the church. I don't want you to take your rent money and bring it to the church. Your rent money is to pay your rent. Your mortgage money is to pay your mortgage. Your food money is to buy food. Praise the name of the Lord. But the Lord expects you to tithe. As it said in uh, the book of Malachi, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse so that there should be meat in my house. Each of us is supposed to uh, return our tithes, not pay. Return it because it belongs to God. We're supposed to return our tithes and we give our offering. And after you finish, give your offering and return your tithes. The rest of the, the money that it belongs to you. No preacher is supposed to pressure you and make you feel guilty. And make you feel like you're supposed to bring all of your money, the rest of your money to the church. If all of us tithe and give our offering, there will be enough money in the church to do everything that the church needs to do. And uh, it's about time that some of these ministers, they need to back off and give the people a little room so that they can do something for themselves. You know, I remember in Old Testament time, when they were building the tabernacle, the Lord said to Moses, tell the people to bring certain type of gold and different type of jewelry and different type of, you know, uh, material to build the temple, the tabernacle. And when all of the uh, material came in, the Lord said to Moses, tell the people to stop. We have enough. Which church out there will tell their people, we have enough. We don't need any more, you know. <laughs> so that's why I'm saying to you today, I want our people, I want people to know that they have to be wise and they have to use wisdom. And you do not give more money to the church than you, you're supposed to. Don't give more money to the church than you're supposed to. That is the reason why you have so many men out there with these big fancy cars and big expensive million dollar house and, and they have private jets and you know who have you know X amount of motor cars and they could drive one every day. You think that is what God wants your money to go into? I say no. Just like how these men want to live well, God wants you to live well too. Praise the name of the Lord. So what I'm saying to you, you don't give more money to the church. I'm going to repeat it again to the tip of my voice. You do not give more money to the church than you're supposed to. The amount of money that God wants to give to the church is the tithes and the offering. When you give that, all this seed, faith, and all these you know, bring a seed faith and sow for this and sow for that. That is a trickery. They are using these so that they can swell their bank account. You think these seed faith gift going towards doing things for God? It's not going towards doing things for God. So yes, we're supposed to make whatever we have available for the use of the Lord. But we do it with wisdom. Praise the name of the Lord. Some people are hypnotized by these guys. You know, once they know they have some kind of money in the bank, they're going to press them to make a donation, bring it in. You don't need to do that. You got to look after yourself. You got to look after your children. You got to make preparation for your grandchildren. You got to make preparation for your retirement. You think the pastor that have the private jet, when the time comes for you to retire, you think you can go and try to find him and Ask him to help you out because you don't have enough money to, um, for, uh, to retire on. No, they're not going to bother with you. So you have to look after yourself. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. We continue in, uh, in uh, it said, <laughs> praise God. Uh, the Lord in verse 3, and he entered into one of the, the ships. These were not little fishing boats like we know back in the islands. You have a two-man boat. With an oar and these two guys, they will be rowing and going out uh, to catch fish. These were 
big size boat that probably can hold maybe 10 to 12, maybe 14 people can fit in these boats. They were good size. And uh, the Lord said, uh, the Lord entered into the ship, which was Simon's, which was Peter, and prayed him that he would trust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. The Lord asked Peter permission. The Lord went into the ship, asked Peter to go out a little bit, you know, further into the water so that he can be a little distance away from the people. And uh, the scripture says he sat down and he started to teach the people. That was the common uh, position that teachers will take back in those days. Today when we're teaching or when we're preaching, we stand up. But back in that time, the teachers, they used to sit as they communicate to the people. And here we see that Jesus, he sat down and he started to teach the people. Jesus, he placed great emphasis in teaching the word of God, explaining the word of God. We need to teach the word of God. We need to preach the word of God. As Timothy tells us, preach the word in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke with all long suffering and doctrine so that the man of God, the woman of God can be made perfect, mature, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. It is the word of God that will bring us to maturity. Praise the Lord. So we need to teach the word so that the eyes of God's people can be opened. The Bible tells us that my people are being destroyed because of the lack of knowledge. One of the, some of the greatest enemies that the church have today is false teaching. There is so much false doctrine that is in the church today. And that the church is under attack from inside the church. The, the, you know, our enemy is not on the outside. Our enemy is on the inside. It is the false teachings, the false doctrines that we have in the church today that is destroying the church, that is turning people away from the church. For instance, when you look at the, um, the prosperity gospel, when they said that God wants everybody to be rich, God wants everybody to have, you know, big houses and X amount of dollars in the bank and all of that, that is a false doctrine. When you, they, they tell us about, you know, um, uh, the, the faith message, that if you have faith, God is going to heal everybody, whatever you want from God. Once you have the faith and you ask God for it, God is going to give it to you. That is another false message. When you look at the healing message, when they tell us that every time, every person that's sick, God is going to heal everybody. That is a false message also. God will heal whenever he chooses to heal. And nobody can force him. Nobody can pressure him. When we are sick, we have to ask the Lord. And if the Lord chooses to heal us, praise God. If the Lord chooses not to heal us, anybody say praise God? Praise the Lord. Glory be to God. Amen. Hallelujah. If I'm sick, I'm going to pray and ask the Lord to heal and to restore. If the Lord chooses not to heal me, to God be the glory. Hallelujah. I'm not going to become ex uh, upset. Could imagine you die and you pass away and you're angry with Jesus. You're angry with Jesus. You die and when you wake up... <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you're angry because Jesus didn't heal you. No, man. When our time comes that we have to go, we go and rejoice. Hallelujah. Even though you might be weak, you're still you're shouting in your heart. Hallelujah. You're celebrating in your heart. The Bible said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We need to tell people what they can expect in life. Brethren, some of us, we will not get there. The nice house, you know, the house with the picket fence and all of that. And the horse and the buggy and the nice cars and the X amount of money in the bank. A lot of us will not achieve this in this life. Glory be to God. But that doesn't mean that God failed us. Some people think that God failed them because God don't give them X amount of money and make them, you know, become rich like this one over there or whatever. But we need to trust the Lord and we need to serve the Lord whether the Lord give us um, material things, yes or no, the Apostle Paul say, in everything, he learned to be content. He say he learned to be content with little, 
He learned to be content with much. Whether he have much or he have little, he is content. It's, uh, last week I was talking to um, uh, a friend of mine at work. And he's not saved. He's not born again. He's a Catholic. I keep telling him that he, he, ha- he needs to be born again. And he said to me, say, Eric, you know, I, I don't understand how some people just grab enough for money. And he said, I have a little um, condo. I already pay for it. He's about a few years from retirement. I already pay for it. And I have a, a few dollars in the bank. And, you know, I have some food in my house and stuff like that. I feel content hearing that coming from an unsaved person. An unsaved man is telling me that he have a little condo that was paid for and he have a few dollars in the bank and he have food on his table and he feel content. Are you content with what you have? Glory be to God. I'm telling you, I'm fully contented with whatever I have. And I believe that the Lord gave me more than I deserve. The Lord allowed me to have access to more than I deserve. The blessings that The Lord gave me in life. I don't deserve it. And you too, you don't deserve it. Praise the name of the Lord. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. So the Bible tells us Peter was asked by the Lord to go out a little further. And Jesus sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Verse 4. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your net for a catch or a draft. Let down your net so you can catch. You remember at the beginning of the, um, these verses, we read where the fishermen, they were out and all night and uh, they, they, they came back in and they were washing their nets. They were preparing their nets so that they can go back out. Uh, the, the, when the night, the next night comes so that they can fish to make their living. And here, uh, Jesus used Simon Peter's boat, and after he finished speaking, uh, the Bible said that Jesus said unto him, launch out into the deep. And when he said into the deep, he's not talking about far, far away deep. What this is talking about, they remember Jesus telling him to go out a little further from the land so he can use the boat as a pulpit. Jesus is telling him to go out a little bit more into the deep um, waters. It's not way out into the deep areas where these men are accustomed going to fish. Because fishing in Galilee, what is said that fishing in Galilee, the fishermen, they used to fish at night. Because when they fish at night, they have to go out into the deep areas to catch the fish. Because when the night comes, the, the, the water is cool, and it's said that the fish come up uh, to the surface, and it's a lot easier to catch um, these fish. So here we see Jesus is giving Peter a command to launch out into the deep. Keep in mind, Jesus was not a fisherman. Jesus didn't know anything about going out in a boat and fish. Jesus was a carpenter. And here we see Jesus is giving an experienced fisherman, somebody who went out the night and was preparing probably to go home and get some rest so he could come back to go back out the the next night. And Jesus is telling him to launch out into the deep and not only that, put your net down for a catch. And it tells us in verse 5, And Simon answered, answering, said unto him, Master, In other words, he addressing him, master, or we will say boss, you know, (laughs) boss. (laughs) He said, master, (laughs) we have toiled all night. The word they toil, it means work hard. It means that you go through all kind of suffocation. Amen. He was toiling all night. Amen. And uh, while toiling all night, he said, and have taken nothing. Master, we were out there all night. We spent all, our, all the time that we were supposed to be in our bed. We were out there toiling all night. And we haven't taken anything. We haven't catch anything. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Here we see Peter is an experienced fisherman. And Peter knows that when he wants to catch fish, he has to go way out. He has to go way out into deep waters. Praise the name of the Lord. And he have to do it at night. 
But here we see Jesus is telling Peter to do something that he wasn't trained for. Peter wasn't accustomed fishing during the day. And Peter wasn't accustomed catching fish, um, fishes right you know, in open area close by the seashore. When he wanted to catch, he had to go out into the deep and he had to do it in the night. And here we see Jesus is telling him something that he's not accustomed to doing. And as I said before, Jesus was not a fisherman. Peter was an experienced fisherman. But here he said, Master, praise the name of the Lord. We have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Brethren, when we have the word of God, when the, the, when the Lord gives us a word, we have to be ready, we have to be willing to obey. It doesn't matter how experienced you might be. It doesn't matter how educated you might be. You know, unlearned you might be. Once it's a word from God, once the word comes from God, we have to obey. And look at Peter was an experienced fisherman. Jesus wasn't an experienced fisherman. And uh, here Jesus is telling Peter to go out into the deep. Hallelujah. Let down your net. And it takes, it wasn't Peter alone to throw the net out. It was a big, those big saying. Because as I said, these boats probably was carrying maybe six or seven men when they go out. And they have this big saying that they will throw out. So it's not a one man thing. Peter has to get the rest of the guys and they go out and they have to put the, the net or the saying, throw it out. Praise the name of the Lord. And he said, nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. You know, sometimes we think that because of our knowledge and because of our education and because of, you know, our experience, um, the word of God doesn't really mean a lot to us. So we can't really trust the word of God. We trust our feelings over what the word of God is saying. But brethren, the word of God has final authority. The word of God overrule your feelings. The word of God overrule your knowledge. The word of God overrule your education. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. And when they had, <laughs> had this done, praise the Lord, they enclosed a great multitude of fish. And their net broke. Here we see Peter decided that he's going to obey the Lord. Peter knew that he wasn't trained to fish that time of the day. It was in the night he was trained to fish. And Peter knew that uh, the fish don't really bite and they don't really saw face in that kind of an envir uh, environment. But he decided he's going to obey the Lord. And when he obeyed the Lord, he and his, his crew, they let down their net. And the Bible said they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. And I'm seeing here how God reward Peter. And he reward Peter and his men. Jesus used Peter's house. He went to Peter's house and he refreshed himself. They had, you know, this kind of get together there where they have, uh, I believe, things to eat and stuff like that. I'm sure that Jesus participated in what was prepared. And here we see Jesus is using Peter's boat. And now Jesus is rewarding Peter. When we make ourselves available to God, God is going to reward us. When you, whatever material thing you have, when you say, well, Lord, whatever I have, it belongs to you. It doesn't belong to me. It is yours. And whatever you, you need me to do, I am available to do it. And you make yourself open to the Lord. I want to say to us, God is going to reward us. Hallelujah. God is going to repay us. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Said, their net, uh, and their net break. <laughs> you know, they, they have so many fishes in their net that the net, the strings that hold the net together, it start breaking. Because the, 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 the amount of fish that they have in the net, it was too heavy. And uh, they beckoned on to their partners, which were in the other ships, that they should come and help them. So they have so much. <laughs> the blessings were too much. 
and they have to call, call in their partners. You know, sometimes God bless us so much and we have so much and it's overflowing. But you know, we can't call somebody else in. We don't want to share it with somebody else. But here we see that these men, their, their blessings were overflowing. So what they did, they call in their partners. Brethren, we all should be partners where the blessing of God is concerned. Glory be to God. If God is blessing you and you can help somebody to be blessed, you have to show them and you help them so that they can be blessed too. And you know, the more God bless you and the more you bless other people is the more blessing you are getting. Hallelujah. But sometimes we are so tight-fisted. You know, sometimes God use one individual. One individual to get out so that one individual can help the rest of their family. And that one individual, instead of they, they use that opportunity to help the rest of their family or help the rest of their community. They decide to keep all the blessing for themselves. And they decide to be close-fisted. But when we are close-fisted, when the Lord bless us and we don't want to share what we have, how, how, how do you think God is going to continue to bless us? The more you share what the Lord gives to you, is the more the Lord is going to bless you. Praise the name of the Lord. God is still in the blessing business. Praise God. Hallelujah. He rewarded Peter and his crew. Praise God. Their net break and they have to call, they beckon onto their partners, the Bible said, and uh, to come and help them. And they came and filled both ships so that they began to sink. Could you imagine that? <laughs> not far from shore. Not out into the deep area where the fish are custom biting. Here we see Peter, he thought that he, he knew where to go and fish. <laughs> but here we see Jesus, he knew where all these, uh, 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 the fishes in the ocean were. He had knowledge. Jesus had prior knowledge. And he know where the fishes were. Glory be to God. This is not the first time Jesus know the location of fishes in the sea. Remember when uh, some people came to the disciples and talked to them about paying taxes. And Jesus was there. They relate the story to Jesus. And Jesus tell them to go down to the sea and throw out a line. And uh, they will catch a certain fish. And that fish have a piece of money in its mouth. Could you imagine that? And people trying to say Jesus is not God. How can you know that there is a fish that is swimming around out there in the ocean with a valuable piece of money in its mouth? <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. How can you know that if you're not God? And Jesus, he knew where uh, this fish was with this certain amount of money in its mouth. And Jesus was able to say, go and catch it and take the money from its mouth and pay for yourself and pay for whoever needs to be paid. You remember again when uh, it was the time for the, 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 the um, Passover when Jesus was about to die and they have to prepare um, the Passover meal, the, Lord, the Last Supper. And uh, Jesus said to them to go over into the other city. They were in this village and he told them to go to the next village and you will meet a man with what? A water pot. Maybe it was um, Eric Duncan over there with a water pot. He, he, remind, he remind me when I used to carry water on my head. <laughs> when people in the islands would go for water and they balance the water on their head. Amen. I was watching Adi. I said, Adi, <laughs> if you was in um, St. Vincent or Grenada, you probably might have started to carry water on your head and my wife get upset. <laughs> she, she, she said, no carrying of water. <laughs> so this man, he was over in the other village. And he have a pitcher of water on his head. And Jesus was able to know that this man is going to be in that village at a particular time with a, a, a bucket of water on his, hair, on his head. And he was able to say to his disciples, go and you will see this man, follow him. And he will take you to an upper room that is prepared. And this is saying here that the Lord have prior knowledge. Jesus is all knowing. And he know all of these things in advance. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And uh, as we continue. So they began to sing. When Simon Peter saw it, 
he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Look what happened here. Peter saw all of these, you know, among the fishes that in the net, the net began to break. The two ships, the two boats, they are sinking. Peter realized that this is not an ordinary man. This is not an ordinary human person. This person is a spiritual being. This person is God. And what Peter decided, he fall down on his knee. Jewish people, Jewish people, they don't fall down and worship men. Because they know what the commandment of their God is. And Peter was a Jew. And he was a synagogue worshiper. And he knew he's not supposed to worship a man. But here he's falling down on his knees. And he said, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Peter is calling Jesus God. He's calling him, O Lord. And here, Jesus didn't say, Peter, get up from off of your knee. Peter, I am a Jew just like you. I'm an ordinary man just like you. You're not supposed to worship me. Jesus didn't raise Peter up from the ground. Jesus received um, whatever worship that was given to him by Peter. Peter acknowledged him as Lord, and Jesus did not dispute that. For he was astonished, and all they that were with him at the catch or draft of fishes which they had taken, they were astonished. They were surprised. They were shocked to see the way how the Lord blessed them. Praise the name of the Lord. God will bless us, brethren, if we continue to trust him. If we continue to be faithful. If we are not so demanding. I think if some of us are not so demanding, I think God is going to bless us more. <laughs> some people are too demanding. And that's the reason why God can, can open up the windows of heaven and pour them out a blessing so that there should not be enough room for them to receive it. Because we are so demanding and God has to let us know who is God. Hallelujah. It's like if you have a, a child that wants to demand things from you. I want a car and I want it now. And I want you to give me X amount of money and I want it now. Sometimes you gotta set, you got to show them who is the parent, man. And I think the Lord is doing that with a lot of us. Because we are so demanding. And we don't want to trust Him. We don't want to wait. We don't want to wait upon Him. And brethren, if we wait upon God, God is going to bless us. And our basket is going to overflow. Glory be to God. He will bless us in our going out. He will bless us in our coming in. Whatever our hands touch, it shall be blessed. The blessings of the Lord will overtake us. We need to trust the Lord. Praise the Lord. For uh, Peter said, <laughs> Amen. Depart from me. For I am a sinful man, O Lord. Peter recognized his sinfulness. And he recognized who he was before the Lord. We need to acknowledge our sins. When we sin, we need to acknowledge our sin. We need to repent. If you sin against the Lord and you don't repent, that sin is unforgiven. I don't care how much worship song you sing. I don't care how many times you come before the altar and you're not going before the Lord and you are saying, God, I'm sorry, I repent, I acknowledge my sins, I turn, uh, forgive me of my sins, I repent of my sins. Until you repent of your sin, your sin is still there. The Bible said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Meaning if I sin and I know that I have sin in my life, and I'm calling on God, and I, I'm not talking to him about the sin that is in my life. He said, God is not going to hear me. So we need to repent. Elder Lewis a while ago said, we all need to examine ourselves before we partake of the communion. We need to check ourselves and see if there's any filthiness. It's a good practice. When you go before God, say, God have mercy upon me. Search me. Examine me. Cleanse me. Wash me. Purify me. Sanctify me. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God in closing. And so, <laughs> so they were um, astonished at the blessings that they received when Jesus said to go out into the deep and let down your net. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zedebee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. 
So Jesus reward them. And he tell them, fear not. From now on, what you're going to do, instead of you catch fish, you're not going to go out and catch fish anymore. You'll be catching men. You'll become a soul winner. You'll be winning soul for the Lord. Yesterday, me and Elder Lewis was talking about soul winning. And he was expressing to me that his great desire is to win soul. God wants us all to win souls. And when he said about catching fish and become fishers of men, God, the Lord is saying here, Peter, what, what, I, what, I, what I have done for you here, what you see here, the miracle that you see here, you need to go and share it. You need to go and testify. We need to know and we need to learn the power of testimony. The book of Revelation said that we overcome the enemy by the word of our testimony and by the blood of the Lamb. When you are saved, you're supposed to testify. And you're supposed to say what the Lord is doing in your life. And we need to know what a testimony is. A testimony is not talking about your job. A testimony is not talking about how much material things you have. A testimony is saying where the Lord took you from. Where the Lord, the Lord saved you, the Lord delivered you, the Lord set you free. You talk about the goodness of God towards you. I admire um, um, my brother back there, um, Brother Gil. You know, you, you hear the simple thing that he's talking about that God uh, doing in his life. You know, he's talking about the sunshine. And he's talking about, you know, last time he talked about where God brought him from. We need to know what a testimony is. It's to talk about what God is doing in our life. The Lord save you. If the Lord save you, you can't be afraid and you can't be ashamed to talk about it. When you're in love with a man, ladies, you ladies, when you're in love with a man, it doesn't matter who the person is. You, you, you can't be ashamed to tell them. Some young ladies... They met guys that they love with and their parents tried to break them apart and they wouldn't, they wouldn't let go because they love the man and they're not ashamed to identify with that man. You know, when you're in love with a woman, you'll go any distance. The place is not too far. You know, I remember when I met my wife was courting way back in Trinidad. <laughs> you know, she living way down in Carnage and I way up in Mova and I come home from work doing construction work, tired. But, you know, it's not too far for me to go down. I, I take taxi and go down to Carnage so I, I could see her so, because I'm in love with her. And I'm not ashamed. And when you're in love with Jesus, you're not ashamed to recognize him in your life and to talk about him. And we need to fall in love with Jesus. When we fall in love with Jesus, when testimony time comes, man, I tell you, you know, it's, it's hard to keep you down on your seat when testimony time comes, if you really love the Lord. And sometimes the moderator is up here and they have to force us, they have to pump us to testify. I remember in the olden days, sometimes you get up, you try to get up to testify and somebody always in front of you. So for you to get a time to testify, you have to stay stand up so you can get an opportunity. We need to share what God is doing in our lives. We need to become fishers of men. And when we become fishers of men, in closing here, the Lord is going to bless us. The last verse, he said, um, The Lord said unto them, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. So here, at the height of Peter and James, and John, the height of their business, their business is prospering. They never catch fish like that in their whole life. And here we see when they came to land, they bring their ship to land, they forsook all and they follow the Lord. This is what we need to do, brethren. We need to follow the Lord. We need to serve him in spirit and in truth. And when we continue to follow him, he will lead us and he will bless us. And as the Bible said, whatever we put our hands to, he shall be blessed. I'm going to ask the um, worship team to come and help me with this song. Ask the musicians to come back. We will sing, bringing in the sheaves. You're here today. When the saints go marching in, we will all march in before him to receive our reward. Let not your heart be troubled. Hallelujah. God is going to reward us.
Praise the name of the Lord. Whatsoever man sow, that shall he also reap. We bow our heads before the Lord. Praise God. If you're in your seat and you need prayer right where you are, you can bow your heads before the Lord. Acknowledge the Lord. Turn your life to the Lord. Repent before him. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Father, we want to thank you today for your goodness. We want to thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. God, we want to thank you because you know the end before the beginning. And Lord, you know our weaknesses, oh God, and our discouragement, our disappointments, oh God. And even as we cry out to you, Lord, hallelujah, we call, oh God, Lord, for your help, for your divine intervention. In our situations, oh God, Lord, intervene. Lord, in our waywardness, we pray that you'll intervene, Lord. Hallelujah. God, I pray that you'll speak to the hearts of your people. Glory be to God. You promised that you'll marry to the backslider. Oh God, when we seem to become wayward, Lord, you are still a loving God. We confess our sins before you, Lord. We confess our iniquity before you. Forgive us of our sins and our iniquity, Lord. Make us holy, Lord Jesus. Sanctify and cleanse us by the washing of water by the word. Oh God, strengthen us, especially in these last days that we are living in, so that we will stand strong, oh God. We will be courageous. We will run the race that is set before us. Looking on to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. We bless you, we praise you, and we glorify you. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, of Nazareth, God's Son. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank Glory to God. Praise, praise God. We we'll sing our dismissal pr- uh, song. I think maybe after we have some an- announcement. I think um, the Lord bless thee. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make His face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up. God bless us. God give you peace. Have a good week. In Jesus' name. Any announcement? Praise God, yes. Anybody lose their bus pass? Touch around your pocket.